Hi, welcome to Blogging Heads TV. This is Culturally Determined, and I'm your host, Aria Cohen-Wade. And my guest today is Jason Zinneman. Jason, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Jason Zinneman. Uh, I am write the On Comedy columns for the New York Times, and I wrote uh, the book Letterman, The Last Giant of Late Night. Yeah, so I'm, I'm holding the hardcover of the book up to the camera right now. Um, the paperback just came out? Yes. Is that correct? Yes, just last month. That's right. Um, so thanks so much for doing this and for sticking with doing this because we originally set it up when the hardcover came out. It took me a long time to, <laughs> to get prepared. Yep. And by then you had other things on your plate. Um, but with the publication of the, of the paperback, uh, we have a chance to once again talk about it. Um, so I, I, I really enjoyed the book. I'm a Letterman fan who came of age watching the show in the 90s. So kind uh-huh. of after the Letterman heyday, but uh-huh. uh, he was definitely one of the big like formative influences on my sense of what was what was funny. And for anyone who um, you know just to watch the Letterman show or has any interest in comedy, uh, I definitely recommend pick up the book. It's a great biography. Is, is it the first like actual biography of of Letterman? You know, there was a. Um... Uh, a, like a, a quickie paperback biography in the mid '80s um, that uh, was just sort of whipped together. Um, but but if you put that aside, which you might as well, uh, it was it was the first. Okay, cool. Um, so why don't we? I was, I, I was shocked by that. In fact, when I wrote the book, uh, I I was sort of did it thinking that there would be several or at least one more than one, but there but never came. Yeah, and he's such a—I mean, he's such an unusual figure. Um, so the, there's lots to talk about. Um, why don't you talk about why why you chose him as a topic in your own like personal history with uh, with Letterman as as a performer? Yeah, I mean, I um, I I guess I didn't start thinking about it seriously until I got the job as the comedy critic for the Times, and in. That's a weird job in that it, it involves both, or not weird, but it, in the Times, there's a lot of jobs for critics and, and reporters. And, some, and when I started, particularly, there was sort of a wall between them. But uh, I do a lot of reporting, and I would talk to a lot of comedians who were incredibly influenced by Letterman. Um, and it seemed like to understand sort of comedy today, he, he was a big figure. And that made me think all about, you know, the real reason which I wrote it, which is that you know, he was, uh, you know, loomed so large in my childhood. Um, you know, the show started in, uh, 82, um, when I was, uh, seven and, you know, as, as long as I've been and the morning shows on 80, as long as I've been watching TV, he's been on. And if you would have, you know, found me in high school and saw what I looked like and how I acted and and how I, um, move, even how I moved, um, you would see somebody who was clearly imitating David Letterman, uh, you know, subconsciously. Um, and so, you know, on, on a really fundamental level, I, I saw the book as like using, I mean, I saw it as a big comedy story, but I saw it as using the, the tools of reporting and criticism to try to explain this thing that I had a massive impact on my life. Um, and cause I think Letterman is interesting that he's not just important in terms of comedy or in terms of television, but there's a whole generation of people. And probably I would say the demo is most not, not exclusively men, but a lot of, a lot of men, a lot of white dudes, uh, who, you know, learned, uh, about what is cool through David Letterman. Yeah. Um, the, the, your mention of movement just made me think, uh, my wife and I are uh, rewatching, uh, Inside Amy Schumer, and there's a skit where she plays a, uh, you know, be- beautiful celebrity who's appearing on a talk show, and it's Bill Hader hosting the talk show, and he's doing kind of a veiled Letterman impression, but it's mainly in the gestures that he's doing it. You know, he has the, the it's like the stiffness, and he has the pencil that he's like yes. throwing at the camera or something, but he's, he's imitating um, Letterman ver- very closely, even though he's not like you know, he's not like made up to be him, but that's just, he's playing talk show hosts and he's like doing the Letterman gestures. 
Yes, I mean that's that's a fascinating sketch there because they never mentioned Letterman's name, but it's clearly all about him and his relationship with women. But I mean, I remember just to, Bill and I remember when I would tell a joke in high school, I would all my when I would tell a punchline, I would always go like this. Because Letterman did that. Of course, he did it because he had a band over here. <laughs> they would hit a rim shot. So it just looked weird, me in the hallway of the school, going like this. But I couldn't tell a punchline of a joke without going like this. I mean, it was – and it became just like, you know, part of how you – or even like Letterman and – I, and I sort of try to build a case for this being part of why he's so great, you know, loved language and funny words and the sound of words. Mm-hmm. And there's certain words – that like, uh, you know, lambada that he would just love to say and say, repeat over and over again. And, it, and I find that if anything, that's an example of something that not only did I have back when I was young, but I have now more than ever. I mean, cause I have two kids and when I joke with them, um, a lot of the joking feels very like the sort of letterman silliness with language. Um, that, you know, in the, in the, the varieties of his humor, that's the kind that really is, uh, you know, can work on any age. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the, the influences on Letterman coming from Carson, Steve Allen and Jack Parr? Those like the three big, um, talk show hosts of the era when Letterman came of age. Yeah. I mean, the, the, um, I sort of have to tell in the book, like a kind of pocket history of the of the talk show, which was really, you know, uh, invented by Steve Allen and uh, Jack Parr uh, followed him up after only three years, and he really uh, made it his own. And then he was replaced by Johnny Carson, and because Johnny Carson was around for so long, everyone has kind of forgotten. Steve Allen and Jack Parr, except for sort of comedy obsessives. And when you saw interviews with Letterman, he would always talk about how much he revered Carson. So one of the big, which always baffled me because Letterman always seemed like the antithesis of Carson. And to people who watched the shows back to back, it almost seemed like late night was a response to Carson or Letterman was, was a, was a critique of Carson. And one of the things that, um, you know, I tried to, one of the questions I began the book with is how can, this guy who reveres Carson end up making a show that seems the antithesis of it. And um, so anyways, the, that, that's a, that's a long way to say from Steve Allen, he took a lot of um, his sort of stunts and goofy side, like, you know, Steve Allen would, uh, you know, the, 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 the dipping yourself in a big vat of water or in a big thing of cereal or this kind of things, which you still see alive in like Jimmy Fallon, he, he took. Um, Jack Parr is the great example uh, of a late night talk show host that used his own neuroses and his own sort of personal demons to create comedy. You know, he would sort of uh, in the way that like talk show hosts or like radio talk show hosts would almost do now, I would say. Um, And Letterman, especially as in his later, his mid and later career would would do that. Um, You know, Carson is really like, was so smooth and remote, which had nothing to do with Letterman. And he also was quite conservative in terms of the kind of comedy. Um, but if you, you know, he, um, he, there was a few things that he, that he took from Carson. For example, Carson was quite good in how he responded to a bad joke, to a joke that bombed. Um, and Letterman, when I asked Letterman, what, what things do you like most about Carson? What are your favorite ep- things about Carson? That that was very telling to me because one, he mentioned um, responding to a bad joke, which of course Letterman does all the time and builds whole shows around the terribleness of his of his, of him. Um, and two, he mentioned this one episode where he Carson goes backstage at a, a sitcom that Don Rickles was doing, which was something that Letterman you know pioneered, which is taking a show backstage, showing you the behind the scenes, but really it was completely uncharacteristic for Carson. Uh, is it, you know, it really wasn't something he normally did. So um, the relationship with Carson is, is very weird and complex because he both was reacting to him. And at the same time, you know, his great dream was to host the tonight show. Yeah. Yeah. That was actually a, a question that I had. I mean, we're skipping ahead a little bit. Um, you know, eventually uh, he, 
competes with uh, Jay Leto to uh, get the Tonight Show, and it's seen as the Great Crown Jewel. But he, yeah, his show is like a deconstruction of the, of the classic um, talk show embodied by uh, by Carson. Why did he want to host the show that he like created <laughs> created the deconstruction of? I mean, it's a great question, and you know, it's like uh, I think it's one thing that's really interesting is that. Um, if you talk to all his writers, and this is a generalization, it's not true of all of them, but his writers are like, you know, like me in the sense that I don't, who would want to be like Johnny Carson? I mean, Car- Carson, you know, Carson, they didn't, they didn't revere Johnny Carson. And in a lot of ways, they pushed Letterman to be less like Carson. So um, I, I think Carson, you know, was, was an image of success. Um, and Letterman is a person who, you know, was, he's not, he's not, he didn't, wasn't motivated by something simple. He both wanted to put on a great show, but he also wanted to, you know, be successful, make a lot of money, do well. And in that, the, the model to the exclusion of almost anything else was Carson. I mean, it's hard to overstate how small the, the population of late night talk show hosts were at that point. Um, you know, it's today, there's so many talk shows in these days when there was only a couple networks um, and some of them, which had no history with talk shows, um, you know, it, Carson was kind of it. Um, you, you, you know, Dick Cad was kind of in a different category in the seventies. And then you had these guys, you know, like Ernie Kovacs was another one who a lot of people think letter was influenced by letter was influenced by, but you know, he was just another generation. So um, I think it was sort of inevitable. And, you know, there's the fact that Carson really gave Letterman his, his, break in his career um so and you know we're all to some degree a product of our place and time and letterman came out of the comedy store in the 70s where everybody's dream was to be on the the tonight show Mm -hmm. um so the portrait you you paint of letterman is an interesting one Uh, one of the things that stuck with me is that he really didn't seem to like talking to people and you describe like writers who worked on staff who people be like, well, what's Dave like? And they would be like, like, I don't really know. Um, so why does someone who did, doesn't like talking to people, apparently, why did he want to host a talk show? <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I, I don't, I don't think, uh, at the beginning, um, the guest segments were, the parts that he enjoyed or wanted to do. Um, that changed by the end. I think he came to terms with what the job is and, um, and his interests shifted. That said, I think his interviewing, you know, one of the kind of counterintuitive arguments I make in the book is that he's actually was a great interviewer in the eighties. Uh, and despite what everyone, including him says, he, that was one of the show's strengths. Um, but, uh, I think he fundamentally was a, you know, a comedian, a broadcaster. You know, that's how he would describe himself. I mean, the important thing about Letterman is that he grew up in the age of radio. And, you know, those were the the original um, kind of voices that he really modeled himself after. And I think he saw, you know, he always w- w- wouldn't describe himself as a talk show host. He described himself as a broadcaster. And what he meant by that were these kind of radio DJs or these sort of variety show hosts. Um, and, uh, you know, one of those, one of those aspects was talking to guests, but that was by no means the part that he was most interested in. He, uh, and if you look at like his early radio work in, in school, in, in college and, and in Indiana, you know, he uses the guests in, uh, as foils for his sense of humor. And I think one of the innovations he did is that he would took that to late night. You know, he he used guests in much more creative ways than had been done in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, an, imp- an important figure who I, I guess I, I had heard her name, but I didn't really know anything about her um, in David Letterman's life is uh, Meryl Marco, if I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and can you talk about who who she is and also kind of about how like the boys club of the show versus the fact that he had this important collaborator who was a woman? Yeah. I mean, she in some ways um, is as important to 
David Letterman in creating the aesthetic of his talk shows. Um, and I, I, I knew about Marilyn Monroe before when I started this project, but I didn't know the extent of her contributions until I got into kind of the, the nitty gritty of, of what actually she was responsible for. She was his girlfriend um, when they were uh, stand-ups and comedians in LA in the 70s. And then she with him helped found uh, the, this morning show in 1980 in which she kind of helped produce and write. And then she was the original head writer of Late Night. Um, but none of that really captures exactly how important she was um, because for a couple reasons. One, she founded Stupid Petrix, Viewer Mail, um, and all the remotes, three of which are as much the show's trademark as anything short of the top 10 list. Um, remotes being the videos they did on the street. Um, two, I think to that original question where we talked about, was like, how does this guy who reveres Johnny Carson put on a show, which is so in the opposition of Johnny Carson? Well, to a large degree, it's because of Meryl Marco, who has a, has a sensibility that is much, was much more experimental, adventurous, conceptual. She's a, you know, a Berkeley uh, art professor. And he is this Midwestern frat boy. He <laughs> is a stand-up comic who likes hard jokes. And she is a Robert Benchley loving writer who likes to kind of create a loopy mood. So it was really the marriage of these two sensibilities that made Late Night so great. And I think, you know, what a lot of the writers told me is that if they wanted to, you know, get something which was a little weird on the air, they they would get Meryl's buy-in first. Mm -hmm. uh, she would convince them. So um, I think once he had, you know, it goes to the question, like, why, why should we care about Dave Letterman? Like, what, 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 why is he important, right? And, you know, he's important because of his longevity and because he's funny and because, he, but he's also really important because what he did was something different and new and innovative in this time slot. And to the, if, you, if, the, if the argument for the importance of Letterman is rooted on that, then you have to give Meryl Marco a huge amount of credit. Um, and let me just say, like, uh, almost everybody, including Letterman, does. Uh, everyone who works on the show. Um, they, you know, they, uh, this isn't a, I wasn't going out on a limb making the, the claim that she was particularly important. I mean, it happens to be that, like, one of the good, one of the important jobs of a biographer of a cultural history of a form like talk shows, which is, even more auteur driven than, than film is to explain the importance of writers um, on these shows. So I always knew I wanted to do that going in, but in this case, there really is a great example of a writer who didn't get the credit she deserved. Um, uh, who I, I hope I, I, you know, fix that a bit in this book. Mm -hmm. um, so you talk a bit about postmodernism and how Letterman represents postmodernism, you know that there's a David Foster Wallace short story, I think it's called Host in the um, collected edition, um, about about a um, celebrity, a, a, a woman appearing on Letterman's show, and it goes, it's very, it's like, it is Letterman, it's very, very clearly him. Um, and yeah, the show seems to embody other postmodern themes in the fact that it was so obviously fake, and uh, yeah. Well, I, well, how do you think those that, that this theory of postmodernism intersects with Letterman? Oh, you know, that was one of the really fun things about writing this book is that I got to you know, you go back and you read postmodernism started to be used in like mainstream media in the eighties, uh, and you start seeing it mentioned in TV reviews and film reviews and stuff. And Letterman, this is Letterman's era. This is when he is, you know, the, 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 he represents sort of mainstream cool. And there's so many stories about postmodernism that use him as sort of the, you know, avatar of what that is to try to, you know, try to explain to New York Times readers what postmodernism is. And, um, D you know, David Foster Wallace is interesting because David Foster Wallace, um, wrote some, uh, you know, he, postmodernism is one thing, and then there's sort of uh, irony. There's a lot of kind of navel-gazing essays in the 80s about the rise of 
irony and our culture and our over-reliance on ironic distance and detachment. And once again, Letterman is used as sort of like the, the key figure in this. So um, Foster Wallace, which that, that, that story, which I didn't know about until I actually wrote my book proposal and my, uh, the editor handed, gave a hand to me, um, which is amazing. It's his first, Dave Foster Wallace's first published story. And um, it kind of goes hand in. I mean, I read a lot of Foster Wallace's nonfiction, and, and I knew he was a real critic of, um, you know, a, a critic of irony. But he he really and a Letterman. But he is a critic of Letterman in the way that somebody who uh, was once an incredible fan of him. Uh, uh, he hates him the way that only someone who loves him can. Uh -huh. uh, and his his basic you know take is that. Um, you know, the, this sort of language of, of, of ironic detachment prevents uh, people from expressing themselves fully. It prevents, you know, sort of emotional engagement. And if you consider that, like, at this moment, Letterman was sort of the, the, the most popular uh, entertainer for young people, um, this had a political dimension. This is in an era, the Reagan era, where you would think uh, – the, the coolest thing for young people would be in opposition to the, you know, politics of the day, uh, where Letterman was 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 uh, pretty rigorously apolitical. And if anything, um, he was sort of telling kids to not care, um, to be apathetic almost. I mean, that was the critique. Um, so, you know, that there were some I, it's vi in a lot of ways. Um, Letterman created things that were very influential, but in a lot of ways you look back and you're like, wow, that was a completely different time because now, of course, what's cool on late night uh, is uh, incredible political engagement. Uh, and uh, th it's hard to imagine that version of Letterman and for that matter, a chumminess with show business, um, both of which are the you know, opposite of what, of what David Letterman had. Um, now, I don't think Letterman himself knew or cared anything about postmodernism. Uh, he, uh, and, and nor, frankly, do I, I think he, uh, I, I think he had a natural knee-jerk, sarcastic temperament. And then he had these, uh, you know, Marco and his writers encouraged these sort of conceptual uh, stunts, and the show became more self-reflexive and more obsessed with, with, uh, you know, hackery and bad show business and kitsch. And once that worked, they built upon it and built upon it and built upon it. And then magazine articles started talking about postmodernism and it's sort of built on each, you know, it became, it became more and more self-conscious about its own self-consciousness. Yeah. I need to reread that, uh, that, uh, David Foster Wallace, uh, short story. It's, it's in um, Girl with, the Cur with Curious Hair. And I, I, I read it as a uh, teenager and I was a big Letterman fan at the time. So this was in the late 90s. And I remember um, not liking it because Letterman comes off as a real asshole in the story. And I was like, well, I love Letterman. And this guy's saying Letterman is, is an asshole. So uh, I, I can't like this. Well, you know what's amazing about it is Foster Wallace, as far as I know, didn't know – he didn't know Letterman. He wasn't that – he wasn't that – wasn't that famous at that point. Um, and, and I, I don't think he had that many connections in Hollywood. He was just a, a you know, an academic at that point, mm -hmm. but he so brilliantly captured how actresses feel about going on David Letterman in the 1980s. I mean, if you read the press on Letterman in the eighties, about a half of it is about what a jerk he is to guess and female guests particularly. And there's this short story, which people should read, you can easy to find online um, is all about the, the terror that an actress feels about going on Letterman and then how to manage that terror. And her conclusion, uh, how to manage this monster Letterman is to mock herself, to turn herself into this cartoonish vision of what he is going to mock her as. Right. I mean, there's, it's actually, there's some interesting things about negging I think involved here is that she's, mm -hmm. uh, so she plays this part um, and she succeeds um, and in, and gets laughs. But in so doing, she screws up – this is the narrative of the story. She screws up the relationship with her boyfriend who right. was helping her navigate this. So it's a fascinating – there's a lot of things going on in there. And it's very sophisticated. Um, 
as I mean, it's a great on a what what is trying to say, but it's also just like fascinating because like I interviewed so, all these actresses and they all described exactly what this woman was feeling. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. He, I think he based it. You say he based it on an actual appearance that um, some sitcom actress or something had. And yeah, she. It's like how do you deal with someone who is like a force of ironic detachment? Um, you and she decides only you can meet irony with irony. Um, yeah. So you so you mentioned that Letterman kind of kind of took delight in. Um, going after or um, making fun of or turning into objects of mockery uh, uh, famous uh, women guests on his show. Um, when I was reading this book, uh, it was right around the time that the uh, Harvey Weinstein story broke and uh, Letterman's <laughs> interactions with women are vexed. And I was wondering if if some story was going to break about Letterman, and then I was thinking, like, would you have done it, written anything differently if you had written this book a year later? Um, wh- what do you think about that? That's a really good question. I, uh, I don't think I would have, honestly, um, because when I started writing this book, Mark Whitaker had just published his book on Bill Cosby. And I don't know if you remember this, but... You know, this was the, going to be the big Cosby book. And when the book came out, the Hannibal Verse made the joke and all the, the Cosby story broke wide. Mm-hmm. And Whitaker never mentioned uh, any of the women. And it was on the right. You know, there was, there was lawsuits, et cetera, before this. Um, and he's an incredibly respected journalist. And it was just a massive embarrassment. Um, and uh, uh, the book, you know, was either not taken seriously at all or it was a you know, it was an embarrassment. So I wrote it quite aware. Uh, this is the context that I wrote it in. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't ignore these, his issues. I mean, I, when I originally set out to write the book, I originally was going to write a book just about his work, not about his personal life. It wasn't even going to be a biography. Then as I got into it, I realized you can't write a book on um, a talk show host to not make it about his life because his life is so inextricably tied to his work. Um, and then once I got deep into doing a biography, um, I uh, realized that also his relationship with women was something that he played out on the show. So, you know, I, I write about not just, I write about the sexism in his show in the book both in how he treats female guests, how he leers with, you know, he's leers at them. And that became, you know, the thing that the show that you mentioned on Amy Schumer show with Bill Hader is satirizing that. And I talk about that in the book. Um, But I also talk about the, uh, you know, the blackmail event and and him uh, handling it on on his show, which is about him, him having an affair with interns, which, you know, is the part that I think, would be seen most uh, differently post Me Too. Mm-hmm. Um, that, I mean, it's remarkable when you look at, you know, he admitted to having affairs with people who worked for him on staff, and not only did the audience, you know, not boo him, they cheered him. Um, this is not that long ago. This is too, you know, this is a, uh, so, um, I, I, I don't, although I've had a lot of interesting conversations with people working on the show who disagree with me, but I, I think he would be in a lot deeper water now uh, I don't, than back then, and I don't know if he would survive it. Um, mm-hmm. that, that, that said, because of this Cosby book, <laughs> I did a lot of reporting on, um, I did a lot of reporting on Letterman and Women. That wasn't necessarily all sourced to the level that I could put in the book, but to make sure that I, I that I was covered on this, mm-hmm. that there wouldn't be that when the book came, I feel I feel comfortable that when the book came out, that I'm not missing some vast thing that has not been already covered in the press. Mm-hmm. Uh, now you know we'll see what happens, but that I, I did do a lot of reporting on this on issue of you know harassment in the workplace, and some of that's in the book. And some of it isn't, um, but the stuff that isn't isn't like oh, there's some the, the the big news is there isn't this other big shoe to drop that I found. I tried, looked, and I didn't find. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, 
you mentioned uh, Letter- Letterman's self-loathing, and that's one of the themes in the book. And it was a theme on, on the show. You know, he would tell jokes that weren't funny, and then talk about how bad they were. And the top ten list was never really funny, etc. Um, I can't remember whether this is included in the book or this is something that came out after um, the discussion about uh, him having depression and uh, taking antidepressants. Um, could you talk about that that theme of self hatred and verging into depression? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you know that that is the one thing that everybody who worked with him mentioned that this this sort of consistent quality of uh, of um, you know self criticism that um, uh, which veered into self loathing that I think you know is both critical to his the, the the greatness of his humor because a lot of his you know he took this thing that he liked about Johnny Carson and making fun of a bad joke and he he built it into this whole you know ornate app or joke apparatus that he um, that was the filter through which everything flowed through at the same time it also um, you know could be paralyzing and it made it a uh, it made it a very difficult place to work uh, and. You know, I talk about the story about the Oscars. He hosted the Oscars, and it was this notorious disaster. And I tried to figure out, like, actually, if you go back and look at it, it, the Oscars got great ratings. And I thought he did a quite good job. So I was like, why do we all think that Letterman did such a terrible job at the Oscars? Well, if you look at the reviews when it first came out, it's, like, mixed. There's some good. There's some positive. So how did it become suddenly the biggest disaster of all time? Well, if you, you could, I track, I found, I, I got every single joke he made about the Oscars, which he told for years. He told, you know, hundreds of jokes that got more and more elaborate on how terrible he did. He basically created his own disastrous myth, um, yeah. and, uh, um, which is what he'd always do. So, but yeah, that, that, so what is this? What is this? Uh, maybe it's just depression, right? Maybe it's just, this, and he eventually did get, you know, um, you know, medicated on this, but yeah, I mean, the consistent personalities are self-loathing and uh, hypochondria, um, and they both show up in his show. Um, I mean, it's funny. There was one comedian who I guess I I can't say who it is because it wasn't like it's not wasn't off the record, but it was on background. Or who I interviewed, who read my book, and uh, the uh, this is a person in late night. And they said they were they told me that it was one thing they thought was funny was that in the you know, I talk about how when Letterman's father uh Letterman's father was kind of a love to tell stories and make jokes and but he never had an outlet for it. And when he died, Letterman sort of interpreted it as, Oh, here is this um you know, he was unhappy because he never had this outlet. And so that stirred him to make the biggest decision of his life, which is leave Indiana, go to L.A., right? And this guy was like, but then you read the whole book and you realize, like, no, the reason he was unhappy is because this, he has, like, a genetic disposition to depression. <laughs> and, like, he never saw that, but it's, like, clear as day. It's like that's he just inherited the same depression. And there's something to it that he's, you know, he uh, – he, he, now it's interesting if, if if he was diagnosed in the eighties and he and he was you know I don't know whenever Prozac came out he took Prozac what, what impact that would have on his comedy I don't know yeah <laughs> that is, that is, that is a, a counterfactual to imagine the uh, the um, you know serotonin medicated <laughs> Letterman uh, yeah. what would have happened um, so the the Letterman that I um, grew up with was the C- CBS um, Late Show with David Letterman. Yes. Uh, Letterman. Wait, and so I didn't start watching probably, you know, I have, I have a memory of, um, watching, um, the first show that I ever saw of him was like New Year's Eve. And my parents let me stay up late and it was Roseanne Barr and Tom Arnold doing uh-huh. a joint interview. I don't know if you could, if you could place that probably would have been 92, 93. Yeah. Um, and then I watched until I left for college and continued to, um, watch in college. Um, but I, you know, so I didn't know, I didn't, 
I didn't know that I was past the golden age when I was watching Letterman. Can you talk a little bit about like the changes between the NBC show and the CBS show? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I would, I still, that was still a great show. I don't, uh, and in some ways it was a better, I mean, the, the, there are certain things that were better about that show, but, uh, um, but yeah, when he went from NBC to CBS, he, uh, the show got, uh, it moved to a theater, so it had to get, uh, it was a bigger room. It, the jokes had to, they had to be more joke heavy, more punchline. Did, did he call it a, the, a big show before he moved to the Ed Sullivan Theater? Because he used to say that every episode. It's a really big show. Right, right. He he would his 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 favorite word in the old show was extravaganza. Welcome to the extravaganza. But I mean, the, the difference is that when he would say that in the old show, it was clearly sarcastic and ridiculous because the, the he was in this shitty looking uh, studio, which was tiny and kind of ramshackle and with exposed you know walls and stuff. But then he moved to Sullivan. It did look like a really big show. Um, and so the the the, the ironic distance narrowed um, bit. Um, or, uh, I mean, one the, probably the line he used most often early on is he would say, this is the only thing on NBC right now. Right? <laughs> yeah. And he, he still used that till the end of his career, even though, um, you know, it meant something different when there was a million channels. But anyways, but, um, the, um, but the show became the first year of the CBS show was kind of amazing. I mean, it got the highest ratings of his career. Um, and it was a big spectacle and it was a, you know, and it, it proved that his brand of kind of ironic, um, you know, detachment could be fused with kind of a big show business thing. Um, and uh, also, I think if you look at some of those late 90s shows, you know, basically he's, he becomes the king of late 90s, he's number one ratings, and then in about 85, 86, he starts losing. So he tasted victory, and then he started losing, and he, he his mood... Uh, fell and by this point the the 80 show which was more writer driven was history the 90 show was more about his personality which is fascinating and his personality and his as his mood darkened a lot of the interesting stuff in the 90 show was just him being incredibly cranky and so there's like these incredible shows of uh they had a character called creepy dave who would like, they had a double, which would just like walk around and stare at him. Yeah. Or he had this one episode where he had like a, a dummy of him on the set where he beat it up. He like, I mean, it was very oh, transparent. Uh, and, uh, or, you know, when he'd have Madonna on and he would get, uh, um, you know, they, they would still have these, like, he was such, he was so famous at that point that he also could get away with all sorts of things. Um, and, um, Anyways, yeah. So, so the, the 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 show became a bigger spectacle, but you still had the just the deep eccentricity of his personality. Yeah. Um, so, why why do you think the um, the Leno Letterman war became such a nas- like national conversation piece that there was a movie made about it on Comedy Central? I think called <laughs> The Late Shift that I saw at least once. Like, why was it just that like the world was at peace and we had, we needed something else to care about. Like why, why, why was this such a huge thing? It seems so weird in in retrospect. It really does. Doesn't it? It's, it's, and it really was a massive, massive, I mean, they called it a war and they did, it felt like one in the media. Um, and it, you know, when I, I, I was also a huge fan in 1993 and it felt like, you know, you had, you had to choose one or the other side, you know, there was no middle ground. Uh, and, um, you know, there was um, – I have a couple of theories on that. One is that the real world premiered, I believe, in 92 or 93, and there were sort of early versions of reality television, <clears throat> but that really was the turning point. And I think that that the late night <coughs> – the late night wars operated like a reality show. You know, what, what was fascinating is to see these characters who were both kind of, you know, Carson was the father figure and they were fighting for the approval of this father figure. And the guests were all sort of, you know, you had to choose sides and they were, they insult each other in subtle and veiled ways. And, and it had the vibe 
Um, and you know the betrayal. They were they were friends. Letterman and Leno were friends. And they had an alliance, and then Letterman helped Leno's career, and then Let, Leno betrayed him. And there was you know, and then every day in the newspaper you had, and you know, Bill Carter from the Times did this great work. These soap operas stories about uh, intrigue and back to in the same way that like people report on Silicon Valley or something like you know these great characters, Mike Ovitz. Uh, who is this like world changing agent who just, you know, manipulated everyone to create this bidding war. And that was all in the paper and it was all fascinating. At the same time, you also have, you know, the beginnings of prestige TV, which is HBO and Larry Sanders show. You know, people often say, Oh, the Sopranos is the beginning of it, but really Larry Sanders show was the first bit of prestige TV. Well, Larry Sanders show was a product of the late night war to, to a large degree. Um, the, er, a lot of Larry Sanders show was about, was kind of commenting on and explicitly borrowing from, uh, the stories about Leno versus Letterman, um, and John Stewart. Mm -hmm. And that was, I think in 92, it premiered. So you have the fictional version of it, which, you know, isn't a massive hit, but is a cultural hit and people are really interested in it. It feels like we're learning something, uh, getting backstage viewed. You have, you know, in the newspapers, it's a great story of these 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 great characters and, and that you're seeing. And then, um, and then, you know, financially, I mean, the numbers back then um, of number of people watching were huge. So the advertising money was huge, and networks were were paying these guys much more than they're paying them today. So they had to subsequently put all sorts of money in advertising and marketing. Um, so, um, it was just a very different time when, um, I mean, talk shows of all, are always going to be popular because they're so cheap, mm -hmm. but that was the one period of time when they were expensive and they were expensive because of David Letterman's, you know, <laughs> salary, essentially, you know, he had, he became an incredibly expensive talent. And then he got them to, you know, move into Ed Sullivan at theater and refurbish it and do all that. Um, do you think he would have been happy? Uh, maybe this is impossible to answer. Um, if he had gotten uh, Carson's job? No. If anything, he might have been less happy. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, what – I mean, I guess the question is, like, would he have felt more constrained on this? It's hard. He couldn't have – I think he would have been more pressured – to do Johnny's show on the Tonight Show, and um, I don't know, I, I I can't see it being playing out any differently. Um, and Leno would have gone to CBS, um, and I, I think Leno also would have eventually beat him in the ratings mm -hmm. um, the same way, which is ultimately what made him would have made him miserable in a different way, right? He's now he's he had got this thing from his hero, and he let him down. You know, he would have found a way to be miserable. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense to me. Um, and it, the some of the, some of the genius came from the misery. I don't, I don't want to make like a misery equal <laughs> equals artistic genius comparison, but clearly he he mined that. Um, so I kind of stopped watching Letterman, you know, around the early aughts. Um, I remember I watched the first show after nine eleven, and then I was in college. I had other stuff to do, and then I kind of. Just to kind of stop watching this stuff. What, like, how do you see like the late period of of him? Is it you kind of go you go over it in just a few chapters, uh, and it's much more condensed compared to the you know the eighties when when he was so innovative. Is it is he just like running on fumes or doing the same shtick over and over again, or or how do you view it? The show becomes the backstage. I mean, some of the most my favorite parts of the reporting of the book was the reporting of that period because it really is this bizarre place to work you know he's so isolated from his own staff that there's people there who worked there for you know a dozen years who barely ever talked to him and um and then so the show became about he, he stopped having um his health he had health problems so he stopped having a rehearsal so he would just basically like show up to do the show uh you know he, he and because of that, it became very hard to do anything particularly ambitious comedically. Um, so you had this big staff of all these vice presidents and, I mean, um, executives and writers, but they didn't really know what to do. 
And so, yeah, the show's quality went down on one level. On the other hand, there is an argument to be made for this period, which is that, you know, the strength of Letterman became sort of extemporaneous talk and conversation, long form conversation. And the best, you know, if you look at like, you could argue that some of the best episodes of his whole career were in this period, namely the show after 9-11, which he, he gives, you know, by far the the most memorable speech of all the talk show hosts back then. And in a large degree, the fact that every talk show host today has to give a speech after a national tragedy all dates back to that one uh, moment. Um, his speech after his uh, he, he had his child uh, was also very you know, moving and effective. His his episode after he um, after the blackmail, I mean that's incredible. That's you know they, we've seen how many times have we seen a politician reveal an affair and the public opinion turns against him. This was the rare example of a of a public figure revealing an affair and people love him more. I mean it's crazy when you look back on it. Um, so that was also, and then you have, you know, the end of him, you know, I think the, I think one of the reasons the 9-11, uh, speech worked and one of the reasons the last couple of months of the show were so powerful is that Letterman was always very tightly kept his emotions in check, was very repressed, very, you know, uh, you know, would, would respond to praise or emotion with a, with a under, with a joke that undercuts it. So when a guy like that is willing to open up and be emotional, you really believe it. It packs a wallop. It's like the, I compare it to like the scene at the end of The Godfather where Marlon Brando is like playing with the little kid. When you see like a like super macho guy who's like, you know, has violent, be vulnerable. and play the game, it, it, it hits harder than if somebody is always being emotional and vulnerable, does it? And I think what you saw with Letterman is, uh, and Letterman at his best is like this, that he would get across either uh, strong points of views, anger, hostility, or occasionally sentimentality indirectly, um, you know, through this ironic prism. And he did that at the end. You saw him get, you know, emotional in his way. And because it was so unexpected, I thought it had a greater impact. So, so I think about that last period is really, um, it's not as good as, as the 90s, the 80s, but it has some, its highs are incredibly high. And I think that, you know, it, when they write his obituary um, and they look at his greatest moments, a couple of them, his most memorable moments will be from that period. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't seen his new Netflix show. Uh, have you seen it? Yeah, yeah, I've seen one. How would you um, how would you describe it as different from the previous shows, and how would you rate it? Well, I think they basically took what I just said, which is to say the the argument for the last period is that his strength is long form conversation, and said, "All right, let's build the whole show around long form conversation. Let's really have him talk for an hour with you know inc incredibly famous people." Um, and cut out the comedy bits and the remotes for the most part, um, and the top 10 list. And, all that. and because he's a really compelling figure and a, a magnetic speaker, you know, that he is always interesting to see. Um, and the first one with Obama, I thought was the best, but in part that's because Obama is really a, a great talk show guest. Um, and, uh, but I've got to say, I, I've only seen a couple. I mean, there's only been a couple of them. There's been, uh, um, but I, 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 they're not completely satisfying yet. Um, in part because Letterman is a great conversationalist, but when he's talking to people who are, he's sort of either like in awe of or really respects, or people who are totally different than him, which he has basically so far, um, you're losing a lot of the pieces that make him a great conversationalist. So, like, it's fun to watch him be with someone who he can make fun of without fear. Um, so the next one, for instance, is on Howard Stern. Hmm. That mm -hmm. I have high hopes for. 
uh, Storm was always a good guest, and he's both very different than Letterman, but also he felt comfortable, and they could kind of – Letterman, you know, one thing that all his, his head writers told me, or several did, is that Letterman is best in reaction. So if you have someone he can react against and use his, you know, natural sort of irreverence and sharp sense of humor, uh, that's – so I'm hoping that – will be a little bit more interesting. But and there was some of that with, with Clooney, but uh Jay Z and, and Malala, that that those were um it felt like people from like these different worlds and, and he was sort of being a little bit more on eggshells. Um I would love to see I mean there there are there are great moments in every, in each one of them and in each one of them he does go out of the studio and have remotes and interviews with people outside. And that, those are actually always really high points. Hmm. Um, they're like he, a man on the street kind of thing. Like, yeah. he, I mean, they're, they're more targeted. Like he, he goes to talk to John Lewis and he goes to, uh, walking around this Oxford or Cambridge, uh, with Lyon, and, and there is a little man in the street, random people. That's always incredible. I mean, that is one of his great gifts mm-hmm. is, uh, making something out of nothing. Um, and, uh, so, but, but yeah, I mean, but if I'm, I haven't written about it yet. They, I haven't, so I haven't sort of really thought rigorously about it. Um, but I, I've been intrigued by it. I think the idea is really good on what to do with him at this stage in his life. But there's something that's not completely – doesn't completely live up to expectations for it. Um, so all conversations on blogging ads have to mention Donald J. Trump. Um, <laughs> and so – Letterman ended the show in 2015. Did he end the show before or after Trump declared for the for the presidency? I think right before, right okay. before. Yeah, so that's a, so that's almost a weird bookend. Um, the end of the Letterman era, the start of the Trump era. Uh, yes. Although Trump must have been a guest on the show multiple times. Um, yeah. How do you think Letterman would have handled would have handled Trump as uh, object of satire? I mean, actually, I wrote a really, really long piece on which is one of my favorite things i've written in the last couple of years of the times on the history of trump on letterman which um uh, is long um you know the uh uh tr- and you know one of my arguments is that we have this idea when, once letterman left there was all this nostalgia oh if letterman was around he would have hammered trump he would have uh you know he, and there was a few clips hillary used a clip of letterman saying to trump Oh, where do you make your ties? And he's like, after railing about trade, and he said, uh, you know, well, I don't know. And he brings out, it says made in China, and, and she put it in an ad. And then it was the same week it came out that Jimmy Fallon rubbed Trump's hair. So everyone said, oh, Fallon is a stooge and Letterman is, if only Letterman was here. But if you actually look at the history, you can make a case that nobody in entertain, popular culture normalized Donald Trump more than David Letterman. Mm-hmm. Donald Trump was a was a regular figure dating back from 1985. And then by the time we're talking about this last stage, this last 15 years, he was on twice a year for like 15 minute segments each. Uh, and he would test run what became his his stump speech, his populist message on China, you know, on on trade, on deals, on Muslims on the the the, the um, building on on W uh, World Trade Center. This this populist message he gave test run to in front of a blue state audience, and he got cheers. Um, and you see Trump, you know Trump, you know he had other a few other forums. He was on Howard Stern, but this is in front. This is a national audience, um, and. You see Letterman arguing with him occasionally, like Letterman argued with him about in, the environment. Uh, Letterman arguing with him about the 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 mosque in, at World Trade Center. But you also see Letterman making a lot of hair jokes and, and laughing off, you know, what he's saying and treating him essentially like a. I mean, here's what my I I I think I argue. He's one of the first national figures respected figures who treats Trump like a really smart political mind. Hmm. Um, that is not, you know, Howard Stern did not have Howard Stern, uh, Trump on 
to talk about politics and about intellectual issues. You know, he had him on to gossip and talk about the women he slept with. Letterman, on the other hand, had him on, and he, and, you know, all the way back in 86 and in 88, and then talk about Ross Perot and, you know, after that, and talk about uh, the election, you know, in 96. And, oh, what about, right? He, that, w Trump was like the way that Anderson Cooper was or something. He would come on and talk about politics at a time when people didn't think of him as a political pundit. They thought of him as a, either a businessman, a reality show host, or a buffoon. And Letterman, to be fair, also treated him like a buffoon. Um, so, um, it's a very interesting relationship because they are both figures who came to fame in New York in the eighties. Right. Um, they're both, um, uh, I would say they're both animated by ne sort of sharp negative attacks, uh, in the eighties in particular. Um, and, uh, the, uh, um, they ended up having very different politics, um, but uh, there one thing that comes through if you watch all of them those their, their conversations together is they like each other. Um, uh, they get along, um, and uh, I can see, and, you know Letterman was yeah, he doesn't pull punches with them, and he he's become quite a harsh critic of them. Um, but the, the big example, for instance, I mean, here's the, 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 the most startling thing that I revealed is that Trump's – when he started doing the birther thing, um, Letterman was watching – you know, came out and he, in a conversation with Dr. Phil said this was racist. Dr. Phil said, you know, I don't like what he's saying, but he's not racist. Other, no, it's racist. What he's saying is racist, all right? This is – I don't know. Was it 2012 or something like that? 2013 when he started doing um, – Trump calls him up and says, I'm not coming on your show again. I'm boycotting your show. Let him go and says that this is what he does. For like a year, for the only like a year and a half, he does not go on the show. Letterman capitulates. He says, I'm not going on your show until you apologize. So after a year and a half, Letterman goes on. He says, I, you know, I don't take back Chris and the brother, but he's not, it's not saying his racist is wrong. He's not racist, and I'm having him back. And Trump comes back on the show. They joke around, talk about their hair and stuff like that. And at the end of that very segment, he says, "What about trade? Oh, where did you get your ties made? Made in China." Brings out he brings up the tie made in China. That's the clip that Hillary Clinton uses hmm. in the ad. So on the very clip that you ever you think Letterman is really damns is is Trump's harshest critic is actually the the example where Trump says something racist, doubles down on it, and is rewarded for it. Um, so it's a pretty – when I saw that, I was like, wow, this is, a, this is, this is quite, you know, that's quite revealing. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I mean, they're, they're both uh, postmodern figures in their way. I had a conversation with a uh, philosopher on Blogging Head's uh, sister site, Meaning of Life TV, to talk about whether – Trump is a postmodern figure. Jeet here has written about Trump as postmodern. I think, I mean, if we consider that like Letterman was, you know, had this kind of like LOL, nothing matters kind of belief and a, you know, just ironic, you know, purely nothing, yeah, just like nothing really matters. Then you bring on this guy who's entertaining to look at for a while and he, uh, has funny hair and you know he says some stuff and then you're you can send him on his way and maybe that's just the way that um uh, letterman viewed him and a lot of other people viewed him that way before uh the right. past couple of years yes no no definitely definitely i mean and, and if some of that stuff that you mentioned he mixes in some really ugly comments which he does you know like trump all every man caught in scandal Mike Tyson from rape, uh, whatever was ever in the news, Trump defends on Letterman. It's really <laughs> striking, like including when Letterman gets caught on the black uh, for blackmail. Trump comes on and said, "Good for you. You 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 know you you were aggressive and hit back hard. You know more people should do that. You didn't settle. You know you like <laughs> you know try, you, it's it's um and so when you're laughing off this or like the things that Trump says about his ex wives on the show." Are like, I mean, but let their, let their, you know, it needs to be said. 
Trump is an amazing guest. I mean, he because he he also plays the villain um, in a way that um, you know he plays the like rich villain in a way that is perfectly suited for a talk show. Yeah, so you could see you could see why Letterman really treasured him as a guest. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, we've got about an hour, so maybe it's time to uh, wrap it up. Is there anything else you want to add before we call it a day? Only this was a, a lot of fun, and, and this is a really great interview, and I appreciate you having me on the show. Okay, well, thank you uh, for taking the time. I'm glad um, you were willing to come on. Uh, Letterman, The Last Giant of Late Night, um, Jason Zinneman, um, thank you so much. Thanks to all of our viewers and listeners, and we'll see you again next time.